Okay, friends, we have an exam this week. Uh, the exam will open uh, today and will be available through Friday. Please take it online through Blackboard. You can find it under the course content uh, folder. Are there any questions about the exam? It's open book, by the way. So I've decided to make it multiple choice. Okay, there are no free response questions on it. It will be open book. Um, you should definitely review the videos and the texts in detail before starting the exam. Once it starts, it'll just it'll go off, and uh, you have to take it in one sitting. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, folks, we're a bit behind in our syllabus. I'm going to try to do some catch-up work over the next two weeks to see if we can move a little faster and uh, connect up to where we were before. Um, I'm actually going to start today with Aristotle. We're going to try to finish Aristotle up, and then we're going to go to Augustine and do an introduction to Augustine. So if you bought your Aristotle texts, please bring them out right now. Pull them out. And... Um, in Aristotle, so far, we've talked about several different topics. We've talked about the topic of uh, human happiness and what human beings are seeking. We've talked about how to pursue happiness. And in Aristotle's view, the way to do that is by acting in accordance with our kind. We are rational animals. And by engaging in our, the rational activity of the soul, we can achieve the happiness we are seeking, in his opinion. We also have looked at virtue, which is one of the key components of a happy, successful life, in Aristotle's view, being a virtuous person. And then lastly, we looked at moral responsibility. And for Aristotle, um, people do have free will, and people can be held morally responsible when they have engaged in actions that are a function of their free will. Sometimes that means being held morally responsible in circumstances where in the moment you couldn't do otherwise, but at a prior time you could, which is something that we've looked at. Okay, um, we're turning now to book five of the Nicomachean Ethics, which is a book where Aristotle talks about the subject of justice. Okay, so um, when I use the word justice, think with me for a minute about what you think of. Um, so I can use it in different contexts. I could say uh, the just thing to do is to share our resources with them. Come on in. Come on in. Uh, we've got seats over here. Or I might say um, he was a terrible man. I'm glad the court did uh, visited justice upon him. Or I might say, uh, concerns of justice ought to be central to our decision making here. What is the common thread? Like, what does justice mean when you hear it used in those settings? Intuitively, can someone just give us a starter definition of justice? Yes. So I sent out a review sheet. Did people get that? Okay, good. Yeah. Uh huh. Just take a look at your email, and uh, there should be a, a short review sheet available there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you think of when you hear the term justice?
Okay, good. I love that. Excellent. Yeah. What someone deserves. Okay, I think that that's the key to understanding justice is it is what people ought to have or ought to get, what they deserve due to some sort of merit on their part. Now, that might be good or that might be bad. Okay, so maybe people uh, deserve punishment due to bad behavior. He killed a man. He deserves to uh, maybe life, be imprisoned for life or to um, be executed. Come on in, ladies. Uh, there are spots like towards the back, I guess, or wherever. Good to see you. I wasn't actually expecting to see either of you. Oh, did you email me? Both of you emailed me, yes. Okay, but it's great to see you. Good, okay. Um, it could be good. So it might be that someone deserves benefits or rewards as a result of working hard. And so the just thing is to pay him a fair wage or something. Okay, but the common thread is I think people should get what they deserve. Now, under the topic of justice, uh, Aristotle's, Aristotle investigates several different themes, things like compensatory justice or rectificatory justice. What I want to pull out of Book 5 today is primarily a discussion of distributive justice. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about that and about his views on it. And maybe I'll approach this by using a quick exercise, an intuitive exercise to help us understand this. The subject of distributive justice is a subject that's been incredibly controversial down through the centuries. Different philosophers have had really different opinions about what is a just distribution of resources in society. And people get really passionate and angry at other people uh, because of their differences on this particular topic. But it might be useful for us to um, imagine some different distributive scenarios to think about the subject before we look at Aristotle's views here. So imagine the following scenario. We'll say there are three different options you could have, and we'll call it a roommate lottery. Okay, some of us live on campus, yes? Okay, I uh, live in a dorm, and your roommate, as you know, can kind of make or break your year. Okay, and suppose that you have three different potential lottery scenarios or distribution scenarios that you could sign up for. Okay, um, one is uh, a scenario where the prospects of getting a great roommate are 7 and 10, and a horrible roommate are 3 and 10. A second scenario, uh, let's make great um, 4 and 10. Let's make so-so, a so-so roommate. Also a 4 and 10 chance. And then horrible. We'll make that 2 and 10. And finally, a third scenario, we'll say, uh, in this third scenario, the distribution is the odds of a so-so roommate are 10 and 10. So everybody gets a so-so roommate. Mm, let me describe what I mean here. Uh, great roommate, a lifelong friend, the person's in your wedding, you guys share all your secrets with each other. This person uh, listens to you late into the night as you discuss your deepest fears, your challenges, your interests, okay? It's somebody who you really, really, really want to room with. Horrible roommate, exactly the opposite. Um, this person is messy, this person is noisy, uh, this person uses your things, brushes her teeth with your toothbrush, um, I don't know, wears your clothing. Heck, you might even get sexiled. I don't know, right? Okay, so it's really, really bad roommates, okay? So, so roommate, um, you just kind of live alongside each other. No real engagement or interest, sort of like ships passing in the night. 
this person is, you know, living her life, you're living your life, and yeah, it's just kind of so so. Okay, um, let's see a show of hands. Who would prefer a roommate lottery where the distribution is like this in scenario A? Who would prefer A? Any takers for A? One? Okay, um, for B, who would prefer B? Any takers for B? Most of us vote in the middle. Okay, any takers for C? One insurance purchaser. Why, why C? You know, it's not going to be that bad. Yeah, won't be great. Won't be bad. Nice to be in the middle, huh? Say, why are you uh, gambling? Yeah, I actually agree with you, man. I would have gambled too. I'm, I'm like a gambler by nature, I guess, on, on something like this. I would have I would have gambled too. I would have gone with A. Good, okay, but most of us prefer something in the middle where we kind of split the difference between the gambling and the insurance. Um, suppose this is not a roommate lottery, though. Suppose this is a hospital lottery. Okay, so um, a number of us are commuters. Uh, we drive to school. Accidents happen on the freeway. I was just reading that Tiger Woods was in an accident today. Okay, um, they carve you out with the jaws of life and take you to a local hospital, but they check on your insurance card before they chopper you to the hospital. Okay, and you can get a choice of insurance networks beforehand. Okay, who would like to, well, let me describe what I mean by great, horrible, and so-so. Um, so great, you're out in two weeks. Okay, no long-term damage, the costs are minimal. Horrible, well, so-so is, um, it takes nine months to recover. Costs are extraordinary. Okay, but no long-term bodily damage. Uh, horrible, on nine months to recover, costs are extraordinary, and you have to walk with a limp for the next four years. Okay, um, who would choose this? I totally would choose A again, I'm a gambler. Okay, um, who would choose this? Anybody? Who would choose this? The costs for great, minimal. Minimal cost you out in two weeks. Okay? All right. Um, no, one, no one voted for this. Who would vote for this? It's expensive, but you recover with no long-term effects. On horrible, yeah, you could get a limp. Yeah, definitely. You could like walk with the limp for the next four years. Man. You'd, gam you'd still gamble if I made it 10 years, wouldn't you? Wow. I would gamble too, actually, on the hospital. 10 years? Ten years? Ten years? I don't, I, okay, four years. Four years, though. That's what you're risking. Okay, let's up the stakes a little bit more. I wanted to see if people's intuitions would change if we upped the stakes. Let's up the stakes a little bit more. The lottery of life. Okay, so um, none of us gets to choose the circumstances into which we are born, but the circumstances into which we are born are extraordinary influen extraordinarily influential in shaping our lives. And the statistics suggest that the vast majority of people end up dying in the same socioeconomic circumstances as they were born into. So, would you rather have a distributive arrangement where the chances of a great Family of birth are seven in 10. That means the parents are involved. There's lots of education, lots of money. You can do all the travel you want, okay? Uh, happy relations, etc. cetera. Um, horrible, um, maybe parents are alcoholics, beat the children. I mean, heck, the father's probably not even in the picture. Uh, no money. No educational opportunities, 
I mean, yeah, life's pretty bad. Okay, so, so, um, yeah, I mean, the parents are there, but, like, they don't really care. They care more about their Netflix shows than, you know, helping the kids with their homework. Uh, like, it's not like they're absent, it's just they're not present either, and when you ask for help in your educational ambitions, they're like, you know, just go earn it yourself. Like, you know, we don't really care so much about your education. It's not really a priority for us. Okay, all right. Who would choose this? What, what about the future for Soso? For the Soso? What does the future look like for Soso? Money or opportunities for um, advancing their education. Sure, all. yeah, so it's not like you're getting beaten or like, you know, there's addiction in your family. There's a little bit of money, but not much. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're not gonna go to a great school. Your life prospects are so-so. Okay. <laughs> Isn't this exercise great? Isn't it just like fun? Okay, who wants who wants this for your distributive arrangement? I would totally choose that. Oh my goodness, I would gamble again. Yeah, you would too? That's my view, too, is you can make the best of any situation. Now, the statistics suggest otherwise. So the st statistics suggest that the great majority of people end up in the same circumstances they were born into. Okay, but that doesn't mean you have to be that way. And, like, that's always been my view, too. So I'm like, you know, I'll just gamble. <laughs> okay, um, who would choose this? So-so. Three of us, Okay. <laughs> Four of us, five of us, more are choosing this, okay. Uh, would anyone split the difference, go with the middle? I'll change it, I'm going middle. You're going middle, okay. Okay. Because I have equal opportunity to a so-so life and a great life, and I have less of an opportunity <laughs> to get a horrible life than an A. <laughs> <laughs> true, that is true, that is true, yeah. So if you're trying to avoid the worst scenario, um, well, I guess if you're trying to avoid the worst scenario, this is what you want to be. But if you're trying to avoid the worst scenario while also giving yourself some upside, this is where you want to be. Yeah. Okay, um, did it make a difference? Did the importance of the choice make a difference in your, your voting? Like, so did you find the more important the choice became, did you become more cautious? Or did you become more reckless, more of a gambler? Okay, more reckless? Okay, more conservative? Okay. <laughs> more statistical. I'm when I'm faced with this, I'm like, let's just put it all on black, baby. We're gonna roll this. <laughs> I'm, I'm t I tend to be a gambler, right? On these sorts of things. <laughs> no, no, you only gamble when the odds are in your favor. Yeah, you do not gamble uh, when the house has the odds. That's the key, man. Like you only you only roll the dice if you've got an edge. Okay. Um. Now let me describe some of these distributive arrangements a little bit. Generally speaking, well, some societies are, are have resources distributed like this. Some are like this, and some are like this. Generally speaking, societies that are like this privilege liberty or freedom as their primary distributive value. In fact, liberty is privileged especially over equality. What do I mean by that? Well, in a society where people are free to make their own choices, and there's no redistribution that regularly takes place to take some resources from the wealthy and give it to the poor. But where people can make their own choices, some will make good choices and some will make bad choices. Some will save their pennies, some will fall into addiction and spend. Okay, um, and honestly, good things will happen to some people and bad things will happen to others. So it's not just choice, it's also what happens to you. Some people will suffer accidents, others will get through life in you know, relatively healthy conditions. 
But when liberty is privileged, some rise to the top and others fall to the bottom. And you see societies that are stratified. By stratified, I mean some are very wealthy and others are very impoverished. If you know your history, uh, I could describe a society like that. Um, so pre-revolution France with the aristocrats and the peasants, very stratified in the distribution of resources. Some had it all, others had nothing. This led to social instability. The peasants were like, you know, we don't want to live in a society where we don't get anything. So they, they uh, executed a bunch of the aristocrats. And especially liberty is prioritized over equality. Okay, America is a society that is generally trending in this direction and away from this. Okay, the wealthy have gotten a lot wealthier in America in the last several decades. Well, the poor have not gotten any better in their conditions. Now, at the opposite end, we have other societies that look more like this, where equality is the primary value in the distribution of resources. Equality is especially more important than liberty. Okay, um, you can imagine uh, like European societies, societies with uh, heavy social safety nets. Uh, taxation rates in some European countries are 70 or 80 percent. 70 or 80 percent of your income goes to the government, but you get free health care. You get free education, the roads, the infrastructure, it's all free the government pays for it all. Okay, in a society like that, there are very few who are wealthier than the rest. Pretty much everybody's about the same. And the reason why is because in societies like that, equality of resource distribution is prioritized over freedom of choice in how people want to use their resources. Everybody tracking so far? Kind of follow? True, there are problems there. But here, here are the problems here too, right? So in this kind of a society, the people who are the haves have great health care, but the have-nots get terrible health care. In this kind of a society, everybody gets so-so health care. So, I mean, it kind of all depends on who you are in the, in the society. Okay? Um, good. Now, Aristotle's view on distributive justice is as follows. Aristotle thought that the primary criterion on which we ought to distribute resources in society is moral merit. Okay, um, this is the third point of the lecture, moral merit. By that I mean this, um, he believed that the people who are most morally meritorious, the, the uh, people who manifest the greatest goodness in themselves or the most ethical, they are the people who should get the most resources because they are the ones who deserve it. And that is the just thing. It is just that they receive the greatest piece of the pie in terms of resources. So for us, that might look like um, the pastors getting the highest salaries, the priests, the social workers, those who devote themselves to helping others, the helping professions, doctors maybe, uh, maybe the teachers, right? Uh, I like to see myself as a helping profession. Okay, um, those are the people who should get the most in Aristotle's society because they're the most deserving on moral grounds. Now, does that look like Contemporary America, is that the way we divide resources up in contemporary America? Not at all, right? Okay, we divide resources up in contemporary America primarily on the basis of whatever other people happen to value. So if other people value what you do real highly, then they will compensate you highly for it. But if they do not value what you do, then honestly, you're not gonna get compensated very much no matter how moral what you do happens to be. Okay, so um, for instance, in America, we get people who are like really bad people who make a lot of money. 
Um, let me pick a really bad person. Uh, okay, so Kimmy K, right? We all uh, we all are familiar with her life, yes? Yeah, Kardashian, the Kardashians, right? Okay, so we're all familiar with the Kardashians. And why is her life fascinating to millions? Because it's an entertaining train wreck, and it's like fascinating watching all of the incredibly like silly, stupid, uh, wild, obnoxious, entertaining things that she does in her life. Okay, so the life of this woman who is, you know, unbelievably self-centered and uh, incredibly exploitative of others is highly compensated because she is someone who others see as entertaining and therefore worthy of them giving their money to support. Okay, um, it strikes me that Aristotle's views on this topic are incredibly good in theory, but would never work in practice, certainly not in contemporary America. They seem incredibly idealistic. I'm not saying that it's good that Kimmy K makes so much, but um, we live in modern societies in a society of strangers. So when you go to the bank, you don't know the bank teller. When you go to the grocery store, you don't know the checkout clerk. In a society of strangers, how can you figure out who's the most morally meritorious? Maybe you could base it on profession, but not everybody who works in a particular profession, not all the pastors are actually good. Some are bad. Um, so it's not clear whether that would be successful either. It strikes me that Aristotle's ideas on this, and this is me just inserting my own opinion here, uh, on this topic would be incredibly impractical in practice. Um, but also notice that uh, his views on the topic of distributive justice are radically different than the way resources are distributed in American society. Now, there are elements in American society of a variety of different kinds of distributive arrangements. Okay, so um, let me just illustrate that real quickly. Uh, well, let me ask you guys this. Uh, who plays a musical instrument here? Anybody play instruments? Yes? What's your instrument? Bass guitar. Bass guitar. Okay. Others? Instrument? No one's, like, we're not a musical class? What do we do in our spare time? Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Okay, fair enough. All right, so we all walk into the classroom one day. Okay, and there in the middle of the classroom is a shiny new cello. Okay, and uh, Victoria says, I deserve this cello. Like it's just sort of like appeared there in the classroom. And we're like, why do you deserve this cello? And she says, well, um, I mean, I'm impoverished, more so than the rest of you. And we agree, yeah, you are poor. And uh, she says, you know, I deserve this cello because I deserve a greater percentage of our community resources on the basis of my poverty. Okay, and Esther comes in, and Esther says, no, 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 this cello belongs to me. And we're like, what? She says, yeah, look, I can play it. Victoria can't play it. And we say, really? She starts playing it, beautiful, pleasing music, community benefiting music. Okay, and we're like, yeah, that's a compelling case for giving you the cello. Because you could like improve the community, better the community, right? And uh, Matthew comes in and Matthew says, no, I deserve this cello. And we're like, what? He says, I'm a cello maker. And I think this is one of my cellos. I usually mark my cellos with my initials in a special spot. And we look in the spot and sure enough, his initials have marked the cello. Well, why didn't you have this cello already in your possession? He said, well, you know, I make a lot of cellos. In fact, I've got about 700 cellos at home. Well, that's part, of the, that's part of the question to be considered, isn't it? I have 700 cellos at home. And I think I just kind of lost track of this one a while ago. But I deserve this cello on the basis of property rights because by golly, I made this cello. It belongs to me. 
So there we have it, three different claimants to the cello. One claims it on the basis of poverty. One claims it on the basis of utility, the ability to benefit the community. And let's assume Matthew can't play the cello. And one makes the claim on the basis of property rights. Three different views or criteria for distributing this scarce resource. Just out of curiosity, who would give it to the impoverished one? Would anyone give it to Victoria? We're in Texas, so we're all like, no. I would give it to her later on. Okay, later on? So, like, if you had some cello, that you could, like, get everything that you could play or had played. Okay. Interesting. Then you could add. Okay. So, you can give the impoverished people the scarce resources in a qualified way later on after they're able to use them. So we could all benefit. Interesting. Um, okay, would anyone give it to Matthew as the, the cello maker? Yeah, man, the labor of his hands, mixed it with the product, he built it, like it belongs to him. We can't just forcibly take it away from him and give it to somebody else who didn't make it just because that other person doesn't have anything. All right, fair enough. And I assume the rest of us would give it to the one who, who can play it? Is that right? Esther? Um, Esther doesn't have enough money to do that, man. It's exp Cellos are expensive, man. How does she know how to play it? She's just good. <laughs> um, we have some resources that are given to people in America just on the basis of poverty. We have a social welfare system. Medicaid gives health care to people on the basis of poverty. What's that? Food stamps. Yeah, food stamps. Lunch programs. Yeah, WIC, other kinds of food benefit programs just on the basis of poverty. Okay, we have other resources that are distributed on the basis of your ability to benefit the community. Uh, so let me give an example of that. Getting into... Um, Getting into medical school is a scarce resource. Um, if you become a doctor, uh, that's a pretty high salary for the rest of your life. You're kind of set. You know, it's a great way to live. So we don't just let anybody be a doctor. You have to jump through hoops. You have to do well in undergrad, high grades, get into a good medical school, pass your exams, pass your practica. Okay, so that... This high salary is something that we give to people who actually can benefit the community. We also allocate resources on the basis of uh, property rights. Okay, and in fact, that's kind of the default view in America is that you can retain what you earned with the labor of your hands or of your mind unless some other consideration is more important. Okay, so the government does forcibly take some resources from you each year. A certain percentage of your income is forcibly removed from you. Maybe it's armed theft, call it whatever you will. And it is given to others. But the default is that you deserve the resources that you earn unless society comes up with some other consideration that is seen as a trumping consideration, more important than your own property rights. So we actually have all three as mechanisms built into society, although property rights is probably the default mechanism. Okay, um, a mixed bag is what America is these days, not based on moral merit. In fact, probably, I don't know if there's any distribution of resources in America that's based on moral merit. It would be so much more just if we did, wouldn't it? Like if we paid our social workers, like we pay them like diddly squat now, but if we paid like workers in inner city Houston or something like that, like great wages. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like the reality all too often is that our pastors and priests and uh, and other, you know, People in helping professions get very little. Like, who do we pay the most? Athletes, 
Film stars, celebrities? Not all athletes, that's true. And I look, I'm I'm look, LeBron is an incredible athlete. Like he's unreal. It, and like he brings happiness to millions when they they watch like him play. It, really, it does. It brings happiness to millions. But is he really doing anything for society at the end of the day? <laughs> he's got to he's got to give back a little bit for his public image. Oh, did he? Oh, good for him. He opened up a school. That's cool. All right, all right. Well, good for good for LeBron. <laughs> all right, all right. He is good at dunking. Yeah, and um, I mean. I, we do pay athletes who have you know, real specific niche kinds of skills a lot of money. Like there's some, um, like we have some football players, for instance, in America who get paid a ton, who have really niche skills that wouldn't work anywhere else, but that work really well on the football field. Okay, so like, um, so I don't know. If you are really good at blocking defensive linemen, you can get a ton of money in America. But that doesn't really transfer to anything else. There's not really anything else that you could get compensated that highly for. You could do security? <laughs> I guess you're right, man. I guess you're right. <laughs> all right, all right. OK. Um, that about wraps it up for Aristotle on the topic of justice. Uh, I'm going to move through and just sort of skip the rest that I wanted to do with Aristotle because we got to we got to move on. We're a little bit behind. Um, oh yeah, 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 for sure. Yep. Giving to each what he or she deserves. Mm -hmm. Sure, giving to each what he or she deserves, and there are different criteria for um, determining what he or she deserves. One criterion might be poverty, one might be social utility, one might be property rights, one might be moral merit. There are different criteria that you can use to determine what someone deserves. Yes? Sure, sure. Sure. So generally, that's not justice, that's grace. So I take it that um, we deserve, on, on the Christian view of things, because we sin and do bad things, like really horrible things to each other, we deserve punishment for that. But uh, as a Christian, I believe God gives us grace. And grace is just like unmerited kindness something you didn't earn or deserve that's just given to you. Um, that's, that's great. That's cool. And God can do that. I guess I would say it's pretty practically impossible to run a, a society that way, at least among humans with all our imperfections. Because when you give people too much grace, it's like damaging to them. Right? So if I didn't discipline my kid... When she acts out, if I just said, you know, you can do whatever you want, it would be horrible for her character. And I take it that God gives us measured grace, grace that mediates the punishment that we deserve. But I take it also that often God does not prevent justice from happening to us so that we face the consequences of the decisions we make. Just something to think about. Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. Okay, um, next we are turning to Augustine. Let's take a quick break, a two or three minute break right now. And then after the break, we will do some background on Augustine and get started in the confessions. All right, let's go ahead and get started with Augustine.
His dates are 354 to 430 AD. So right away we notice that he is a long time after Aristotle, 700 years after Aristotle to be precise. By comparison, 700 years ago from us is about 1300. So it's a long time. And two major developments occur during that time period between the time of Aristotle and the time of St. Augustine that are important for our purposes for understanding Augustine's philosophy. <clears throat> One is um, the rise of the Roman Empire, and the other is the rise of the Christian faith. Okay, so let me talk about Rome for just a minute. Um, in the Western world, Rome was an incredible phenomenon. It was an empire built around an unbelievably good infrastructure for the day. Roman roads were outstanding, much better than anything else the ancient world had ever seen. It was also an incredibly brutal empire. Milita militants, soldiers... Efforts to subjugate conquered peoples in the most brutal possible ways. But if you were a Roman citizen, it was a good life. It was peaceful, and you were protected by the state. Okay, and the Roman Empire was for the people who lived in northern Africa, in the Near East, in Europe, in Palestine, it was the world for them. It was what they knew. Okay, and during the time of Augustine, that was beginning to come apart. The Roman Empire at that time had been around for 700 years. By comparison, America has been around for about, what, 250? About 250 years, I think. 1776 to now, you do the math. Okay, um, I don't think America's going to make it 700 years. Not at the rate we're going. <laughs> okay, uh, but also the, uh, the Christian faith is an important development. Okay, so Christianity arose as a small and persecuted sect in Palestine uh, in the first century A.D., and from those humble origins, it went on to become the dominant worldview in not only the Roman Empire, but much of the world. Okay, and it is a compelling worldview. It is my worldview. I'm a Christian. And the ideas spread by the Christian faith were very, very influential and seized or captured the imaginations of millions of people during the day. Um, Christianity promised reconciliation. It offered a master narrative. It explained the world. It showed people why they existed and what their purpose for being here happened to be. And Augustine found it very compelling. Okay, and he is our first Christian philosopher in this uh, course. We'll talk a little bit about why he became a Christian. Um. During the time of Augustine, the Roman world is starting to fall apart because barbarians are attacking it from outside of the empire. And the remaining pagans in the empire blame the Christians for the barbarian attacks. And much of St. Augustine's life is spent defending Christian ideals and the Christian faith against these pagan critics. Let me say a few things about Augustine's personal biography. Um, for starters, this text that we're reading, the Confessions, is not a text in philosophy. It's more of an autobiography. It's a, a set of personal recollections as he thinks about his own life and reflects on his own successes and failures, his own choices, his, his uh, path through life. But intermixed with all of those personal reflections, you can find philosophical concepts. And what we're doing in this class is we're extracting philosophical concepts from the text. We will look at the text and we will extract from it certain key philosophical ideas 
which we will go on to build up into larger themes. Uh, a couple comments on Augustine's own life and times. Um, perhaps more than any other philosopher that we study in this course, his personal biography is important for understanding his philosophical ideas. So I'm going to take just a minute to talk about his personal biography so that we can uh, understand it together. Okay, um, let me illustrate it with a map. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Here's North Africa, Tunisia, Egypt, Palestine, Turkey, okay, Greece, Italy, Spain, Sardinia and Corsica, Corsica and Sardinia, Sicily, the other islands, Cyprus. Okay, um, Augustine is born in Tagast, which is a city in North Africa, which is about here. When you think of the Mediterranean, imagine a crocodile's mouth. So like a crocodile's mouth. Okay, he's born in Tagast, and he's born to a pagan father named Patricius, and a Christian mother named Monica. His mother is very devoted. She um, seeks to impart the Christian faith to him, but he is arrogant as a young man. He is um, unwilling to follow her uh, in her life of simple piety. And so he becomes an agnostic. Okay, um, what's an agnostic? Does anybody know what an agnostic is? Uh, no, it's actually the opposite of that. It's where you don't believe in anything, yeah. No, 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 no. Um, well, yes, sort of. Kind of, sort of. Okay. So, um, atheism is where you don't believe in God. Agnosticism is where you say, we don't know. We don't have enough evidence to know whether there is God or not. Yeah. That's, is that what you said? Sort of? Sure? Okay. <laughs> If it's not, I'm sure it's, it's uh, yeah, never mind. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, so Augustine becomes an agnostic. He journeys to the city of Carthage, which is about here. Carthage was a very important ancient city in the Roman Empire. Um, he studies there uh, the subject of rhetoric. Actually, let me ask you guys this as well. What is rhetoric? Anybody know? Speech, especially persuasive speech. Okay, so um, the art of rhetoric is something that was studied back in the day, uh, in Augustine's day, by aspiring politicians, people who wanted to be able to persuade others. Uh, he studies rhetoric and gets good at it. He's a good student. He works hard. He's a good student. He also lives it up on the side. Okay, um, he develops a sex addiction. Takes a mistress, visits prostitutes, has a kid. This is all as a teenager. <laughs> and you thought that your teen years were uh, interesting. They were nothing compared to his. He journeys to Rome, where he becomes a teacher of rhetoric and teaches young uh, men, especially young Roman noblemen, aspiring politicians, the subject of rhetoric, so they can learn how to uh, speak persuasively. Yeah, so sophistry is seen as, um, sophistry is like rhetoric, let me put that word up on the board. Sophistry is rhetoric devoted to lies. Um, so if someone tells an incredibly persuasive story about why you should believe him, but in fact, he's just lying. We might say of him, he's a sophist. He's, he's engaging in sophistry. He's using persuasive speech for the sake of a lie. Rhetoric is persuasive speech that can be used for good or bad. Okay, it's just persuasive speech. Um, okay, in Rome, uh, he teaches young noblemen. He tells stories about, uh, in, his in the text, about how um, 
Well, for instance, like how they used to pay instructors, uh, they would, uh, he would give a lecture, and there would be a box at the front, and as people were filing out, students filed out after the lecture, they would drop money in the box so that he would get paid for each lecture. Um, this is an excellent practice, and I've actually got a box here, and we're going to do, no, I'm joking, okay. Um, the, uh, he couldn't make ends meet as a rhetoric teacher in Rome, because the students all snuck out the back before the end of the lecture, so they didn't have to pay him. Okay, so he like gets upset and he moves to Milan in northern Italy. Milan and Rome are both still important cities in Italy. Has anybody anybody been to Europe? Have any? Yes. Are you from Europe? Whereabouts? From Greece. Oh, cool. I like drew a really bad Greece, didn't I? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool, cool. So you've been to Italy then? You have not? Okay. All right. Well, at any rate, um, I've been to Europe, but never to uh, Italy. Milan is a city in northwestern Italy, and Augustine becomes a Christian in Milan. Okay. Um, he is initially resistant. He's about 32 years old when he becomes a Christian. But he doesn't want to become a Christian. He's like a really reluctant convert. The reason why he doesn't want to become a Christian is because he does not want to abide by Christianity's moral standards. He believes it intellectually. He believes that God created the world, that there is a God, that God created the world, and that humans have been made for a purpose. But he does not want to have to live by the moral standards that Christianity requires of him, and in particular, he doesn't want to give up his, uh, his sexual addiction. Okay, so it's a reluctant conversion. But once he does convert, he decides that if he's going to make a go of it as a Christian, he's going to need to give up all of the, um, the destructive, fun but destructive sins that he had, uh, had done for many years before. And so uh, he does that, journeys back to North Africa, where he becomes the bishop of a city called Hippo in present-day Algeria. And um, there he serves out the rest of his life doing good deeds for the poor, uh, reading, writing, teaching, living kind of an exemplary moral life. Okay. Now, Augustine's biography is important because it is out of his biography that he develops some of his most uh, fundamental ideas. Okay, so we'll start with one of those ideas right now. I've got about 10 minutes, so if you'll indulge me, we're going to dig into the text and take a look at one of his most important ideas. Look in chapter 4 of book 2. Um, I'm not sure if I've got a, tra a translation that's the same as you guys. Um, I don't see many confessions out here. Got one, two, brought the wrong book. At least you brought a book. Good. Um, here's a book. Okay, cool, cool. Cool, cool. I get it, I get it. All right. Um, yeah, we're behind, but we're trying to catch up. So we'll, we'll do our best. That's cool. That's cool. Okay, so if you look in chapter 5 of book 2, I'm looking down here one paragraph in. In a garden nearby to our vineyard, in, in a garden nearby to our vineyard, there was a pear tree loaded with fruit that was desirable neither in appearance nor in taste. Late one night to which hour according to our pestilential custom we had kept up our street games. A group of very bad youngsters set out to shake down and rob this tree. We took great loads of fruit from it, not for our own eating, but rather to throw it to the pigs. Even if we did eat a little of it, we did this to do what pleased us for the reason that it was forbidden. So why did he steal the pears? Why did he steal the fruit? from this passage. 
What was his motive? Did he do it because he was hungry? No. This is a recollection from his childhood when he was 16 years old. It's a recollection of an incident that happened. He did it for the heck of it. Okay, there was no use value. He didn't need the pears. He was not hungry. He wasn't impoverished. He did it just to do it. And as he recalls his childhood and remembers this incident, he feels great remorse over this particular incident. Okay, now when I read this, my first reaction is, dude, of all the things that, you know, bad things that you've done in your life, that we've all done in our lives, you pick like the theft of some pears as like the key incident that you regret? Doesn't seem like that serious a thing. But the seriousness of it is not for Augustine the fact of the incident itself. Rather, it is the intention that he had when he stole the pears. He did it for the sake of it. Did it for the heck of it, not because there was any use value to the fruit. Okay, now that first piece of personal biography is really important for understanding Augustine's views here. Because Augustine builds all out of this incident and similar kinds of incidents that he surveys a theory about human beings. And he says, look, the reason why I stole these pears is because there's something in me that wanted to steal them. There's something in me that just wanted to do bad for the sake of doing bad. And so Augustine reasons that actually this is something that's characteristic of all of us. And he says, um, this is sin. We are, in his words, original sinners. It is, yeah. It is, yeah. Now, Augustine did not come up with the idea of sin. It is a Christian view that precedes Augustine. But Augustine uh, develops this notion of original sin in an especially um, articulate and uh, sophisticated way. He's not in the canon as a famous philosopher because of his originality, his new ideas. Rather, he's in the canon as a famous philosopher because he said in very precise and influential and concise ways stuff that had previously been present but kind of unorganized. Okay, so just FYI. Okay, um, Augustine says, uh, the reason why I stole those pears is because there's something in me, a disease-like condition of the soul. Okay, think of original sin as like a disease of the soul. It's a disease-like condition of the soul which compelled me to steal the pears, made me want to do it just for the heck of it. Okay, now, um, I'm a parent, and I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old. I have a zero-year-old who will be born in May. They're really bad. <laughs> they are wonderful little people. They show great affection. They love me. They love each other. But man, they treat each other like trash sometimes. The, uh, just this morning before I left for work, the one-year-old looked around. I watched this from the kitchen. She looked around. She thought no one was looking. So she stole the five-year-old's toys. Five-year-old has some little PJ mask like action figures. She stole the PJ mask action figures. The five-year-old, however, saw her do it. Because the one-year-old's not real secretive, right? Five-year-old saw her do it. Chased her down. Hit her <laughs> and took the toys back. <laughs> okay, these kids are rotten little sinners. <laughs> um, honestly, I'm kind of with Augustine on this one. Maybe you call it something else than original sin. Call it what you will. But, uh, like, humans come into the world, and like, I'm pretty convinced by his arguments here. Like, humans are kind of messed up. Each new generation pledges to do better, but each generation finds a way to mess up. 
What is it that causes us all to mess up? What is it that causes us to be so selfish and to treat each other in such rotten ways? Well, for Augustine, the explanation is that we are driven by a disease-like condition that he calls sin, original sin. Okay, and uh, he thinks that this pear incident where he steals this fruit is an example of this. It's just sort of an outgrowth of the, uh, the destructive tendencies that he has in his, uh, in his soul. Let me stop and ask if there are any questions or comments about that, about the notion of original sin. Maybe I should ask you guys if you agree with him on this. Do you think that humans have something in us, call it sin, call it whatever you will, that is a disease-like condition that kind of inclines us toward bad? Or are we good by nature? Are humans bad or good by nature? Like, do we intend naturally to do bad to each other, or do we intend naturally to help each other? And we just sometimes do bad just, you know, because society or culture messes us up and not something from inside ourselves. What do you think? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we intend to do good, but we often do bad. And our uh, there's a part of us, call it flesh, call it soul, right? right some aspect of us loves to do bad. We just want to do bad. My, um, my friend was telling me, my friend Andrea was telling me about when she was a little two-year-old. Maybe I've shared this with you guys before. Anyway, um, her mom was working in the kitchen and little Andrea was in the living room. And uh, little Andrea uh, stuck her finger in the electrical plug in the living room. Okay, and uh, fortunately for her, I don't know if it was like the, the way the plug was shaped or what, but she didn't, nothing happened to her, right? And her mom sees this from the kitchen. She says, no, 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 and like starts rushing to her to, uh, to you know, to prevent this, right? Little two-year-old Andrea looks at her mom. She looks at the plug. She sticks her finger in it again, right? Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I, honestly, I'm with Zaire on this. I'm kind of convinced by this about human beings, two-year-olds, 52-year-olds, 102-year-olds. Like, we kind of are all afflicted with the same problem. And that problem is some version of selfishness that makes us want to do what we want to do, even if that is self-destructive or destructive to others. Okay, so I, I personally find this to be a convincing view of humans. Um, now, there have been philosophers in history who have had a different view of humans. Okay, so for instance, one of the most famous thinkers in the 19th century, Karl Marx, had a very different view of humans. Let me just use him as a quick example of a someone who took a different view than Augustine on the issue of sin. Marx said, look, humans do bad things, but they don't do bad things because there's some internal principle in them that inclines them to do bad things. Rather, they do bad things because there is an infrastructure set up in society that inclines them to do bad things. And if we can do away with that infrastructure set up, then humans will become good. He said the problem is private property. The problem is we've got a setup in society where there's mine and then there's thine. This belongs to me and that belongs to me, you. And, you know, I, I, I'm jealous because you've got more and you want to take mine so you steal it. And, and this, this infrastructure setup is what inclines us to be bad. So Mark said if we can do away with the institution of private property, then we'll do away with human badness. And humans will naturally want to live in community in harmonious ways. Okay, so now you, you may agree or disagree with Marx, but I'm just using him here as an example of someone who said Augustine was wrong on the topic of human badness. And actually, human badness is just a cultural construct, and we can do away with human badness if we just make the society different. Okay, now Augustine does have an, a, um, a solution to the problem of original sin, but you will have to watch the video from Thursday to see his solution, okay? So apologies for that. 
This will not be on the test, by the way, this week. Augustine is for next time's test. We're just testing up through Aristotle. <laughs>